Who really runs the world today? Is it politicians or multinational banks, or is it social media and tech giants? In this conversation, I speak with economist, politician, and author, Yanis Varoufakis, who served as the Greek Minister of Finance during the 2015 Greek credit crisis. We discuss how economies crash, the winners and losers of bank bailouts, dysfunctions within the EU, and the real power that politicians have access to in the face of their political rivals and the rising influence of social media and tech monopolies. I'm Shane Farnsworth, and this is the Escape Sapiens podcast. These conversations are supported by the Andrea von Braun Foundation. If you enjoy what I'm doing, please consider subscribing, liking, and sharing this content. And now, here's Giannis Varoufakis. I hope you enjoy. Escaped Sapiens. Just to make this more pleasurable, though, would you like a little bit of an overview or are you just happy to jump in? Let's go straight in. Let's go straight in. Because I was originally going to ask you questions like, what's the best place? You ask as many questions as you want. Just don't give me any advance warning. Feel free to ask anything you want. I don't mind. So so what's the best place to go swimming in Greece then? There is a cove on a barren island of the island where I live, which is where I've asked my wife to scatter my ashes when I'm done. <laughs> um, I don't even know what it's called because it's a barren island. There's no name, at least not that I know. For me, that's the spot. But I'm not going to tell you how to find it. I'm not going to give you the coordinates because it's a very well-kept secret. <laughs> but but why? What, what's, what's the beautiful thing about the island? What draws you to it? Well, look, we, we live on an island um, about a stone's throw from Athens. And because it, where we are, it looks to the other side of Athens, so we can't see the ugliness of the cement blocks. And we can see the beautiful mountains of the Peloponnese. It feels as if we are a very, very long way from mm. civilization. But we're not. We're only one hour's ferry, right? And then, on our little boat, <clears throat> we sail to a t- this tiny island, which is you know, 20 minutes away, at 15 knots. And on the other side of that island, there is this little cove with deep blue waters and pine trees coming all the way down to the sea. And that's like being, you know, a million miles away. Um, and it's the, 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 the human scale. The trees mm. are, you know, my height, a bit taller, maybe double my height. The stones, the rocks, the fish, they're all, you know, as I, as I said, at the human scale, there are no sharks, there are no currents. It is just like it was designed by some divinity for us. So yeah, that, that's my the best I can do. So when you're dealing with <laughs> politics and the economy all day, just getting back hey, and being a human. Goes away. <laughs> I just go there, put some music on, and I am away. I'm uh, I'm in paradise. And also the proximity, the fact that it's so close. I can do this every day almost. You know? mm. so I let's, don't do let's... it every day, but I can do it in theory. <laughs> well, especially when you're not anywhere near Greece, you can't do it. But but let's let's yeah. jump into the economy and, and politics then. So there's, there's two real questions I want to ask you, and they're very basic. So I basically want to ask you what money is and who, who holds power in the world. So th- these are the two... Uh, questions and I thought I'd start off very at a very basic level. You used to be, or you, you've worked as an economics professor, and and so what I want to know is, in your mind, is economics more like the study of psychology or more like, say, physics? In your mind. Okay. Big questions. What's money? The best definition of money I've come across is by Karl Marx. He defined money as the alienated ability of humankind. I think it's such a poetic and accurate description because money, you see, is, it's a bit like in physics, since you're a physicist, it's a bit like light. For centuries, there were deep divisions between scientists on whether it's um, a stream of particles or a wave. So you had huge disagreements 
Uh, Newton thought it was particles, Maxwell thought it was a waves, Democritus thought it was particles, Epicurus thought it was waves. Until Einstein comes along and says, guys, it's both. <laughs> Which is very difficult for the human mind to wrap itself around the idea that it can be both two things that are contradictory. Uh, now, in physics, you can actually prove these hypotheses. You conduct experiments under controlled conditions and you can actually prove it. Money is very similar in the sense that it's got two different natures that seem absolutely incompatible with one another. And yet money is both those things. Hmm. The equivalent of the particle, particle theory of light for money is that it is a thing, that money is a thing, it's a commodity. Yeah, You have uh, wheat, uh, you have corn that can be used to eat, it can be used to plow the fields in the form of seeds, that's capital, <laughs> but it can also be used in order to exchange. So you exchange, you know, a pound of, of corn for a bundle of butter or something. Hmm. Um, so there is a tendency to think of, especially the gold bags, those who you know believe that um, money has to be something tangible, like gold, like a metal, it must be substantive, not a figment of our imagination, like digital money uh, or paper money. Um, they tend to think of money as a thing, a commodity, uh, a tangible. And then there is a completely different view that money is nothing more than a transferable form of debt. Hmm. So if you look at archaeological evidence, there is plenty of it that money did not emerge as a thing, but it emerged as a form of debt. In Syria, in the Mesopotamia, uh, there were we we have evidence that um, the first form of um, widely, widely, widely um, used money uh, were shards of um, clay with numbers on them. And the, the idea was that uh, the hegemon, the landlord, the king, the tyrant, whatever, would uh, use these pieces of clay with numbers on to pay advance payment of the wheat, the corn that had not already been produced, that would be produced after the harvest, to workers. So workers would go home at the end of each day, every week, with one of those pieces of clay, with a number, and that's how numbers were invented. Uh, that's how accounting happened. This is how writing um, was discovered or invented. Uh, the first instances of writing had to do with these um, payment systems. So if it had in the number two, it meant two pounds or ounces or something of wheat were, was owed to you because you had worked in the fields. So you'd have to wait for it. Now, the beauty of it was, of course, that you didn't have to wait to cash it in for wheat. You could use these pieces of clay to go to your next door neighbor and say, listen, you've got a goat, can I have some of its milk? And here is, you know, uh, a piece of clay that is a, like a title deed to an ounce of wheat in three months time. Uh, so what is money? Is it um, a thing? Is it a promise? Debt? And the answer is that it is both, in the same way that light is both. So that's the best I can do <laughs> in order to introduce our audience to the complexity of money and why I love the definition of Marx, that it is the alienated ability of humankind. Hmm. It's been alienated from us, it's been abstracted, hmm. but it reflects our ability to do things individually and collectively. Uh, your second question, I forgot because I'm getting old. Well, we'll get into that towards the end of it. So ultimately, we'll touch on ah, what power okay. is. Okay, that's where we're going to end up. Okay. Ho hopefully. Right. <laughs> we may not, but uh, it depends where we, we take things. But okay, so so this this abstraction then, so this is sort of how I picture money as sort of a, um, sort of a shared fiction. And I, I guess the next sort of obvious question that I want to ask is, 
when our economy crashes, when we go through some turbulent economic times, what's happening there? Is it that the abstraction is breaking down, that our shared fiction is breaking, or is something else going on, uh, sort of at the lowest level? Well, the, the shared fiction breaks down because promises have been made that cannot be kept. This That's what's going on. That's what the crisis is. So um, to the extent that the liquidity of an economic system is a form of debt that is transferable, what's debt? It's a promise. Yeah? You give me the pint of milk, and I promise you something at the end of the, the month. Hmm? Some wheat or, you know, pounds or sterling or whatever. Um, now, in the old epochs, eras, uh, you would have um, war, you would have pestilence, you would have bad weather. That was the cause of the crisis, really. Uh, mm -hmm. earthquakes you didn't have a collapse of economic forces feeding into a kind of domino effect uh, there were occasions when poverty or overextending a military effort you know kings that um, made too many promises to their people and to their soldiers as to how much loot they would get if they pursue a war together. And then if the war didn't go well, all these promises broke down. But this was not an endogenous economic crisis. It was not a crisis of the economy. It was a crisis of politics. It was a crisis of, of the weather. It was a crisis of, the, the, you know, a military campaign gone wrong. It was the advent of capitalism that gave rise to purely economic crisis. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is um, there's been a great transformation somewhere around the 18th century when we moved from feudalism to capitalism. Uh, because if you think about it, under feudalism, the order of play was rather straightforward. First, you had production. The peasants toiled the land. They produced goods, you know, agricultural goods. So that was the production phase. Production came first. Second came the distribution phase. The Lord would send the sheriff to the peasants, you know, armed and dangerous, and the sheriff would steal a percentage of the harvest on behalf of the landlord. It was just pure theft on behalf, you know, legalized theft. That's what feudalism was, right? So you had distribution. This second phase, violent phase, uh, at least potentially violent phase, uh, determined how much of the produce would stay with the peasants, how much would go with the landlord. And then the third phase was financialization. The landlord could not eat all that stuff. So the landlord would sell it in rudimentary markets that were marginal to production, but nevertheless important, get cash and use that cash either to arm and arm, uh, his soldiers or to build a better castle or to found a church or to lend it because the, the lords were the money lenders as well because they were, they were the only ones who had money. Um, so you had production, distribution and financialization. In societies like that, it was impossible to have an endogenous economic crisis. But with the advent of capitalism, the transformation, when the peasants were expelled from the land, they were replaced by sheep in England and Scotland and Wales, uh, because wool was an international commodity by then, due to the discovery of international trade routes and the creation of international trade routes. Um, you have the creation of a working class, which is landless. They've been evicted. They, they live in slums now, outside the, the land. The land now is commodified. It is uh, leased. To former peasants or to the sheriff or to whomever who now becomes a proto capitalist who hires laborers now and pays rent to the landlord but these proto capitalists um to make business work <laughs> to start production first they had to borrow 
because they had to pay wages up and up front so that the workers would not die of hunger not because they were nice people but because otherwise they wouldn't be able to get them to work and also they had to pay the landlord rent before the harvest came in mm. so suddenly what you have is a complete reversal it used to be production distribution finance now it's finance distribution and finally production and this reversal unleashed tremendous productive powers uh, workers were um, uh, forced to, to to be far more efficient the entrepreneurs the proto-capitalists because they were struggling themselves to, to keep their nose under uh, above water uh, they had to improve efficiency they had to invest in machinery um, in order to enhance labor productivity because they were in competition with one another and anyone who didn't do it simply went bankrupt um, so because finance now is at the at the beginning of this production process finance is the linchpin for this new system called capitalism bankers begin to emerge as the liquidity providers of this the system the, the lubricants the lubricators of the system and the the, the more this, is, this system becomes efficient the greater the cut that the bankers retain so the way i've described this is um in in a book a few years ago was to say that it is a bit like um bankers had time traveling hands they would push their hand through the membrane of the timeline and extract value from the future that has not been created yet bring it to the present to fund the production that will produce the values of the future and that of course made them central in this chain and allowed them to become very rich and the more they lent the more value they extracted from the future to bring to the to the present the, more, the richer they got but that meant that at some point they extracted so much value from the future that the present could not deliver it could not the present could not repay the future and that's when promises are broken debts are issued that cannot be repaid and when those accumulate at some point like grains of sand that you lay one on top of the other at some point there's going to be an implosion and that's an economic crisis at that point uh you have a situation where the alienated ability of humankind is in crisis it's in a vortex and you've got unpayable debts hmm. and that's when you have the eradication of debts because pay debts that cannot be paid will not be paid hmm. so, so in in 2008 where we had the bailout of the banks I, I want to understand sort of how dirty this process was because if I if I follow what you're saying what what I understand is happening is that the banks have a whole bunch of a assets that they've accumulated that are not good they're toxic in some sense like loans that will never be repaid this sort of thing and so then the central bank steps in and, and buys them all out at some uh price that's sort of in some sense if I understand you putting the hand into the future I want to understand. Ah, no, no, it's not the same thing. Because you see, when you put your hand into the future, you, you you extract value to bring it in to produce new value. What happened with the central banks was none of that. It was simply printing money to make failed bets whole. Mm. Mm, not the same thing. There was never any productive benefit from doing this. They salvaged the banks by creating money to replace their busted flushes, their busted mm. wages, their busted bets. I, I guess then the question that I have is, ultimately, who wins and who loses? Who, 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 who is it that's paying uh, to, to buy out those busted bets, the, uh, the toxic assets? Well, you see, it depends on what's happening in the rest of the economy as well. I'm quite relaxed about, you know, forgiving debts and writing them off. You have to do it. As I said, an unpayable debt will not be paid. So you need to write it off. There are two ways of writing it off. One is to just write it off. <laughs> really very simple. Say, okay, 
And this IOU is going to be torn up because it cannot be paid. That, to me, is the honest and uncomplicated way of doing it. But if you want to pretend that the debt is sacred uh, and it will be repaid, then the only way of pretending that an unpayable debt can be repaid is by constantly rolling it over, lending the busted entity, the failed banker, for instance, money, con- continue to give him liquidity in the form of you know short-term, medium-term, long-term debt, uh, so as to allow him to pretend that he is honoring the IOUs that he's issued. Now, again, it really is no skin of my nose if you, if, whether you excuse him the debt or whether you roll it over. So the question is, what else is happening, however, around this little drama? Because the tragedy of 2008 and beyond was that while we had socialism for the bankers, you know, the central banks were printing state money to give it, you know, and f- almost philanthropically to the bankers. They were imposing harsh austerity on the innocents, on the people who had not done nothing wrong and who had not benefited for years and years and years through financialization, through um, betting on uh, impossible horses in the financial sector. So when you have socialism for the very few who happen to be the financiers and austerity for everybody else, you end up with a catastrophe that we've experienced over the last 13 years. Because the financiers get their money. There's the ethical question as well, right? The people who created the crisis get power and money. And the people who who suffered the crisis and who never benefited from the makings of the crisis, the many, are suffering austerity. They can't put food on the table. They can't, you know, go to sleep at night because they're so surrounded, so much in the clasps of angst about how they're going to make ends meet by the end of the week. Uh, But besides the ethical point, there's a macroeconomic point as as well. Because the industrialists, the people who benefited from socialism for the very few, for the oligarchy, Look at, you know, they, they, are, they have all this money which is being printed by the central banks and given to them, right? But they're never going to invest it. Because, not because they don't want to invest. They would like it. To, they would like to invest it. But they look out there and they see the masses, the multitudes, being impecunious and finding it very hard to make ends meet. And they think, I'm not going to produce snazzy, expensive products for them. They won't be able to afford it. So if you're Volkswagen in 2009, you're not going to say I'm going to produce an alternative to a Tesla, an expensive $100,000 electric car, because who the hell is going to buy it? Look at them. I'll make little golfs with stupid little polluting diesel engines, as I was doing before. I will fake their their exhaust fume uh, measurements as well and, you know, make money out of that out of the little people with, you know, small, dirty, little cars that I'll sell sell to them. So you've got very low levels of investment. And that also augurs really badly for the green transition, because for 13 years we have not invested in the green transition as we should have. And we can see the effects on the environment now. You can see it on electricity. I mean, we we have underinvested for 13 years. So the tragedy, the, the crime, of the of two thousand of the post two thousand eight period, it's not just that you have excused those uh, busted w- wages of the finances, and that you have printed money as if in the context of a socialism for the rich to give to them. It's also that the austerity you've imposed upon people in the European Union, people in the United Kingdom, people in the United States. I mean, here in this country, we were the champions of austerity world record record hold, holders when it came to austerity, to idiotic austerity, self-defeating austerity. And the result is that you have very low levels of investment. And when you have very low levels of, of investment, what does this mean? It means that demand is low. And it means that 
the only way you can keep finances in health, in letter commas, or alive, or zombified, call it what you might, may, is to keep printing money to give to them. Because they are not going to get it from the little people because the little people don't have any. And because there's no investment to produce new wealth for the bankers to benefit. So for 13 years after 2008, we have had rude health in the financial markets, which was, however, driven by state money that was printed and printed and printed to keep the financiers boisterous, while the rest of the economy was shrinking. So how long can you push this for? What's what's the if there's sort of two questions I want to ask. The first is, you know, what would you have done instead? What what's the alternative? You know, did you have to inject the money up the level of banks or could could have you given money to the lower the people who made the you know, did you have to inject money at the level of the banks or could it have been at the level of the people? And what is the long-term impact uh if we continue to do quantitative easing, we we continue to give austerity to the to the people and, and not the banks. Well, the, the 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 first question that came out of your mouth was how long can this last for? The answer was until the pandemic, because now it's 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 all collapsing on, around us. We can see that. But before I explain why that is happening, uh, let me answer your other question: What could we have done instead? And I think you already embedded into your question the proper answer. Uh, the first thing you do is, of course, you save you, you save the banks because banks are not like other businesses. If a bike shop shuts down, okay, you don't have bikes. But a bank, for better or for worse, I think for worse, the banks own the payment system. Forget credit. You know, whenever you want to buy a coffee these days or buy a book or go to the movies or whatever, you, you need to make a payment. And you make a pay you make a payment using a debit card or a credit card, um, or even some ATM from which we, we, you withdraw money. So and that's all all owned by the banking system, by the oligopoly of, of the banksters. Hmm? So you need to save those banks. You can't allow the ATMs to shut down and the payment system to collapse. Because then you'll have another Great Depression like we had after 1929. And only monsters, Nazis, and fascists emerge from that. But it's one thing to say you should save the banks. It's quite another to say that you must save the bankers. Um, <laughs> so what I would have done, I would have picked up the phone and called them and say, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. We will save the bank. That's the good news. The bad news, we're not going to save you. You are out. Uh, so shareholders um, are wiped out, boards of directors are fired, they are nationalized, and uh, they're saved. Hmm. And this is not pie in the sky stuff. This is precisely what happened in 1998 in South Korea. You know, the Korean state got into, into the failed private banks, took them over, drove out the the board of directors. I remember I was having a very interesting conversation with the finance minister of South Korea. And I asked him, how did you do that? Because we are having such difficult, I mean, you know, bankers are so powerful people. So powerful people. I mean, they have more powerful than, they, they have more power than us ministers of finance. You know, they can fire us. <laughs> he said, well, we use the very veritable institution we have in Korea. I said, what? He said, well, the Marines. <laughs> I set the Marines in and had them uh, leave the building at gunpoint. And I thought, mm, that's a very good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so they saved the banks, and within a year and a half, they had sold them back to the private sector because they were not Marxists, they were not left-wing lingers like me. But they didn't save the bankers. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the message to bankers was, if you, um, if you steer your bank onto the rocks, and it starts sinking, we will save the, the vessel, but not you. Hmm. So be careful. Uh, okay, that was number one thing that I would have done. Can, can, can I ask just qu quickly, did, did that have a lasting effect? So what happened in 2008 and later on? Did, did, the, did Korea have a sort of softer journey as a result of that prior policy? Absolutely. Absolutely. Look at the data. Korea had next to no crisis in 2008. 
<laughs> and what had happened in 1998 had shielded Korea from the vagaries of Wall Street, the city of London, what's happening in the European Union. Um, gone from, from strength to strength. Hmm. Um, and it wasn't just South Korea. It was um, six years before South Korea. It was Scandinavia. The Scandinavian banks in 1992 went bust, all of them. They had made some stupid mis- decisions and they all went bust. Swedish banks, Danish banks, Norwegian banks, Finnish banks. Uh, and the states back then, they, they were social democratic back then, no longer. Um, they they bailed out the banks, got rid of the bankers, nationalized the banks, and then sold them off in, within two years back to the private sector, to different bankers. Um, and they didn't have the same problems in 2008 that the Anglo, the Anglo sphere had, as well as the European Union. Uh, so that's one thing I would do. Save the banks, not the bankers. The second thing I would do, and you already uh, foreshadowed that in your question, if I wanted to boost uh, demand, I would not give it to the financiers. I wouldn't print money to give to the financiers. I would give it to the little, little people. I mean, Donald Trump did it. And then Joe Biden continued with the checks in the mail to little people. Uh, the Australian government did it in 2009 under Kevin Rudd. And the result was that Australia did not have a recession in 2009 because every household, you probably recall that, got something between 10 and 20,000 Australian dollars. It missed me, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> I was a little bit annoyed about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, all my yeah. friends got the, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, you know, even during the pandemic, when uh, the Central Bank of Europe was printing as if there was no tomorrow, I was warning them. I was saying, you're creating a gigantic bubble in real estate because the money can, will go from the Central Bank to the financiers, from the financiers to their mates. Their mates are going to take the stock exchange or buy flats in Berlin. Mm. Asset prices will go through the roof. That will create asset price inflation. Mm. Uh, that will increase the shortfall actually reduce further investment that, and that's going to shrink aggregate supply of goods and services and then at some point some of that money will leak into the economy and there's going to be inflation and then you'll be stuffed which is where they are hmm. so, so the alternative proposition was um why don't you just um send some like 500 euros I proposed, or a thousand euros, or 2,000 euros, depending on the length of the pandemic, send it to people's bank accounts. Mm. And the, the most astonishing answer I got from German colleagues, politicians and bankers and so on, is, Jens, we can't do that. So why, why can't you do it? He said, we don't have the know-how. I said, what? Because our social security numbers are not connected to our banking system. And therefore, technically, we cannot even send the money. Even if we can't do what Trump and Biden did. And I thought, my goodness, this is the state of Europe. Our, you know, the, the great German efficient state cannot even find its citizens and give them some money. They can take the money, but they can't give it. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. So, so let me ask. Okay, so this this makes me think of something else that I'm quite curious about, which is that. Why is it that we don't in in the in Europe we don't have big tech competitors? So, for example, there's no you know French Twitter. There's no why why is it that uh, on these technical grounds people seem more competent in in the United States? Why why is it that you have these you know blossoming tech companies that are missing here? Well, the hegemon always produces cutting edge te- technologies. Before America rose, almost every important technological breakthrough was made in Cambridge, Oxford, University College London, in Britain. Britain was the empire. It produced the technological advances. Before that, it was Rome. So there's nothing terribly um, surprising about that. Size also matters. You have a very large economy in the United States. You've got English, you've got the size of America, you've got English. So if you were going to start Twitter um, in France, it wouldn't really go over that far. 
Um, Twitter went far because the, from the from day one, it was used by us Greeks, by Australians, by yeah, the Portuguese, and so on and so forth. Uh, and first mover advantage is everything. So mm -hmm. once you've created Facebook, there can't be another Facebook even in the United States. Even in the United States, if, if you and I had a much better software for a, a Facebook um, competitor, it wouldn't matter because if 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 anyone wants to join um, something like Facebook, they will go to where their friends are. Mm -hmm. So there is the first mover advantage, which is really very strong. Now, the only country that has developed competitors, real competitors, substantial competitors, very strong competitors to big tech is China. But that's because it there was a political project to do so. Hmm. Uh, they understood really very well that if they, if, if the whole of the Chinese political economy and, so, and society uh, um, enter Facebook, Twitter, you know, buy everything from Amazon.com and so on, any possibility of autonomous uh, growth and development in China is gone. Hmm. Europe never understood that. And, um, you know, we now are in a kind of um, semi-war between Europe and America over social media. You've got, um, you know, the European Commission constantly sniping at uh, Twitter, at Facebook, at Google, at Apple, you know, imposing fines. Ms. Vestager, she does well. I mean, she, she's right on many of the issues that she's got. But as you pointed out, uh, this is just a defensive war. There is no attempt or capacity of the European Union, despite the fact that we are more than the Americans put together, we are richer than the Americans put together. We have a lot of technologies we cannot bring it together <laughs> and create, uh, you know, either compared to Amazon.com or to Alibaba in China. Mm. So with every crisis and every technological advance, Europe falls behind both China and the United States of America. It still surprises me that you say this because, you know, we had, uh, for example, um, MySpace, which was taken over by Facebook. Mm. And I guess now Facebook shares are really tumbling in the last weeks. Mm. And I, I guess TikTok is sort of rolling over YouTube. So there are examples of, of other tech companies rising up. But, yeah, so Chinese. You, but, TikTok so you is think, Chinese. It's European. That's true. That's true. <laughs> but, 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 but do you, I can't do you think... I can't think of a European one, do you, do except you think, Spotify. Do you think um, the EU is, is taking appropriate steps then to break up these monopolies or no? You think they should go further or...? How, how should they, how should they how should they help companies in their own sort of domain develop competitors? How about having a lobotomy to begin with, and <laughs> starting afresh? Because you know, the, the, the the situation with the European Union is beyond a joke. Uh, they have completely failed to rise up to the great challenges of the time. And those, what are the great challenges of the time? The banking crisis of two thousand and eight. The European Union made a complete and utter mess of it. And the result now is that we have 13 years of centrifugal forces tearing the European Union apart. And that has never subsided. They just threw a lot of printed money on the problem mm. under Mario Draghi, but without solving the underlying centrifugal forces that are tearing us apart. So banking crisis, disaster. Mm. Um, green energy, catastrophe. Mm. Catastrophe. I mean, think about it. We have something called the European Union, but we do not have um, an energy plan for Europe. Germany has its own plans, and we saw how great those were <laughs> when Putin invaded the, the Ukraine. Um, France has its own Napoleonic uh, nuclear-based plan. Half of the p nuclear power stations, now that they are necessary because of the height and price of natural gas are now defunct. <laughs> They're out of uh, commission. Um, Greece has its own plan. It's a bit pathetic. I mean, it's, so there's no such... I wish we had a European Union. We do not. We have something that pretends to be a union. Uh, artificial intelligence, 
nothing, zero. There's no plan for artificial intelligence. There, there are pockets of AI here and there, uh, but nothing like the uh, concentrated investment on AI that the Japanese have, that the Koreans have, mm. that the Chinese have, of course, and the Americans. Um, you've got a lot of rent seeking in, um, in in Europe. There is uh, hardly any entrepreneurship happening. It, they're all, you know, the, the, the big wigs are simply trying to extract whatever value has already been created without producing new value. Uh, and the, the with, and, and, and we do not have a government. We have a bureaucracy mm. whose job in Brussels is to behave like the, the bureaucracy of a cartel. Mm. The nearest parallel analog to the European Union Commission is OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. They have a bureaucracy. Their purpose is to coordinate the activities of the different countries with a view to simply maximizing the extraction of rents from the rest of the world. Hmm. But it's, it, they, th th this can never be the source of innovative thinking about creating new values. It's only innovative thinking about how co to corner existing markets. That's what the European Un uh, Union Commission is. And whenever they have a good idea, because there are some good ideas that come out of the Commission, um, since I remember in the 1990s, they've all been vetoed by Berlin. <laughs> all of them, every single one of them <laughs> in some European Union Council has been vetoed by Berlin. And if not by Berlin, by one of the handmaidens of Berlin, because sometimes Berlin doesn't want to be seen to be the, the, the bad guy mm. or girl, uh, in the case of Berlin. So they, they ask the Slovak or the, the, the Dutch to, <laughs> to veto it on their behalf. So, so, so then what does the US have that the EU is lacking? What, what is it that makes the US function, which doesn't allow the, uh, the EU to function a similar way? Common debt. <laughs> treasury bills. You know, the treasury, the US treasury. Uh, we have a central bank here in Europe, and they have a central bank. But if you think of how we constructed it, it was as if constructed by morons in order to serve slaves. Uh, because what we did, we created the central bank without a state behind it. There's no state that can have the back of the European Central Bank. Hmm. And you have 19 states, now it's 20 states, that use this central bank for the money, but cannot rely on it in case there's a banking crisis to bail them out, because it's by its constitution, it's not allowed to bail them out. So they had to bend the, the constitution of the ECB, the charter of the ECB, in order to bail them out. But to do this, they had to get the permission from Berlin to do it. So it's a catastrophe. Hmm. It's exactly what Alexander Hamilton in the United States was trying to avoid and success, su succeeded in avoiding. A situation where you have different states, different former colonies, uh, supposedly one country, but without common debt. Common debt is everything. It's what binds states together. What binds the British together is not so much, you know, the royal family. Hmm. It's, it, it is the pound and the fact that the north of England and the south of England share the debt, the national hmm. debt. That's what gives substance to countries along with languages and traditions and uh, and conventions and, and 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 all that jazz as they say i i don't want to sound too conspiratorial <laughs> you mentioned that the system is created as though by morons but could it be that it was constructed in this way to force federation further down the line is there some sort of intent behind a system which seems not to work currently in your mind Look, the, there were some smart people who thought of the Euro and the European Central Bank in those terms. And one of them was uh, Mitterrand, President Mitterrand of France, François Mitterrand, in the 80s and 90s. Um, I have done good authority. I've written about this. Because a friend of mine was in the room in 1992. 
when the Maastricht Treaty, which is the foundational treaty of the euro, and the European Central Bank, was signed. There was a discussion between the President of France, François Mitterrand, and um, the President of the European Commission at the time, Jacques Delors, who was a friend of Mitterrand and who had been his finance minister many years before, with a friend of mine in the room. And Jacques Delors, representing the European Commission at the time, was trying to convince the French President that it is important to have two pylons, two legs, <laughs> for the Eurozone. One should be the central bank to guarantee monetary stability, and another one should be uh, something like a, an investment ministry or a treasury that would borrow on behalf of the whole of Europeans, of or the, the whole of the, Euro, the Eurozone area, in order to invest. To be the, so there would be the stability leg and the growth or development leg, uh, which of course meant a political union. It meant that if you have a common debt, you have to have common rules, you know, who, who borrows, uh, you need to have a common parliament or parliamentary process to approve the common debt. And François Mitterrand turned around and said what you said. He said, listen, Jacques, um, that would be great <laughs> to do that. We can't do it. We don't have the political clout to do it at the moment. But what we can do is we can create the monetary union. And this is where, you know, the old fox, um, François Mitterrand, <laughs> proved he had very clear vision of the future. He said, when the next large financial crisis comes, our successors will have to choose between letting this whole thing collapse or federating or doing what you're suggesting. So this is precisely what you're saying. Uh, however, he was wrong. And he was wrong for reasons that um, a British Cambridge economist had foreseen in 1971, in April 1971, Nicholas Calder was his name, a well-known economist of the Cambridge tradition, who was actually a Europhile. He wanted the European Union to come together, and he was writing that paper as somebody who was worried uh, about the future of the European Common Market back, back then, the European Union today. So this is now April 1971, just before, a few months, before the collapse of the Bretton Woods system and the fixed exchange rates, when the Europeans could see that it was hap happening, that the exchange rates would no longer be fixed. They needed the exchange rates to be fixed because the European Union was a cartel. They were trying to sell, to fix the price of coal, to fix the price of steel, to fix the price of cars. If exchange rates between France and Germany and Italy and Holland go up and down, it's very difficult to fix prices. <laughs> okay. So they needed the fixed exchange rates that the Americans were providing under the Bretton Woods. But, and they could see that the, these fixed exchange rates would blow up. So they were already planning a common currency or fixed exchange rates in Europe as a prelude to the euro back in 1971. And Caldor in the New Statesman said this. He said it would be a gross mistake. I don't have his names now, his words in my head to tell you verbatim, but I can assure you, you can look it up. Uh, I've republished that paper as well in my books, uh, in a couple of my books. He said, if we make the mistake of thinking that through a monetary union, we create a stepping stone towards federation. Uh, we will have killed off, maybe in that those are not the words he used, we will have annulled the possibility of a political union. Because, he explains, a monetary union without a political union is like putting the cart bef be before the horses. A monetary union without a political union and common debt is going to create a gigantic financial crisis by itself. And when it hits, we are going to suffer massive centrifugal forces, politically, socially, at the level of discourse, and the Europeans will not be able to pol politically to unite after that. And I think that this is exactly what happened. Hmm. I, I, I suppose you're alluding to the rise of uh, sort of right-leaning politicians and not sort just, of... Not just... No. Look, after, you know, when 
when the, when the banking crisis happened, it started in Wall Street, as it usually does, like 1929. It started in 2007, 2008 in Wall Street. Then very soon after that, we realized that the French and the German banks were kaput, gone. Okay. Yeah. Um, a domino effect starts. Once the German and the French banks are bankrupt, they can no longer roll over the Greek government debt, the Italian government debt, the Irish government debt, because this is who was, they, they were the banks that were lending those states. And then there is, of course, a feedback loop, because once there is a new, uh, once a new, the, 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 the front page of newspapers is full of news of the Greek state's bankruptcy, and everybody knows that the Greek state owes 120, 130 billion euros to the German banks and another 100 to the French banks, <laughs> then that makes the position of the French and the German banks even worse. Hmm? And then what happens is, then politicians starts, start pointing accusatory fingers at one another. The German politicians are pointing their fingers at the Greeks. You messed this thing up. It is because you were so spendthrift and because you sung... Uh, and played the buzuki under the sun in the summer and it didn't work. And then the Greeks turn around and the point and accusate their fingers at the German and begin, you're Nazis, you've never been anything other than Nazis. And that's it, it's finished. At that moment, you have centrifugal forces at the cultural level, the political level, the ethical level, you know, the every level. And you go now to any German or to any Greek, any Dutchman or woman or French person and say, do you think it's a good idea that we should uh, federate in Europe? They say, bugger off. <laughs> Immediately. <laughs> Which would not, not be the case before 2010. Mm. So I think that uh, Nicolas Calder was completely prescient. Mm -hmm. So sort of shot ourselves in the foot. I, I noticed that, uh, so in, in respect for the time, uh, I, I'm, we're going to have to wrap up fairly soon. Can I just uh, ask with a few, and with a few quick questions about power uh so the main one is who holds the power today is it musk is it biden is it the head of the imf or goldman sachs where, where does power really reside today the hardest aspect of contemporary society to comprehend is that we live in a capitalist world or post-capitalist world where power has been concentrated tremendously inside the confines of a new form of capital without any human being, Musk, Biden, whoever, being in command of it. If you look at Musk on a minute by minute basis, if you actually watch him work, you can see that this is a driven man who's got enormous resources at his disposal, but given his ambition and his um, different projects, he's very constrained. He feels the pressure. He doesn't feel like somebody who can do anything. He doesn't feel like God. Similarly, Jeff Bezos, he's got, you know, hundreds of billions stashed away in terms of wealth, right? But he too feels constrained. So this is a great tragedy and a great paradox. It's like a, an ancient Greek tragedy. If you're watching, or Shakespeare, if you're watching a Shakespearean play, Richard III, hmm, what do you see? You see powerful men on a stage who nevertheless, their great tragedy is that they, the more power they have, the more powerless they feel. Hmm. And it's the nature of the game which extracts power from the many, concentrates in the hands of the few, who are tragic figures and therefore powerless. This is how I understand the capitalist, post-capitalist system we live in. And that's why I'm, I continue to be a leftist who thinks that capitalism is neither natural nor pleasant, uh, or stable, for that matter. In the end, we've created magnificent machines that had the capacity of being our slaves. I'm, I, I'm a tech enthusiast. I love machinery. I love technology. But in the end, 
we become the slaves of the machines. And that is not simply to say that this is the rich versus the poor. There is, of course, the rich versus the poor. We see this on a daily basis. But in the end, even the rich, even the Elon Musks of the world, the Jeff Bezos of the world, they are also victims of this enslavement of the whole of humanity to our artifacts. A kind of Dr. Frankenstein who created the thing, this capitalist thing, which um, has taken over and is threatening our very existentialist uh, condition. Did you also feel that sort of at your core uh, in, in the place of the finance minister of, of, of Greece? Did, did you feel that you had less or more power than, than what you anticipated when you entered the role? Oh, I had exactly as much power as I had anticipated. Precisely zero. <laughs> I knew I would have none. <laughs> I, I knew I would have none because, remember, the only reason why I was elected was because we had a massive bankruptcy and I had become the finance minister of the most bankrupt state in the world, after Puerto Rico, maybe. Okay? Uh, so I knew that I wouldn't have any power. The only power I had was the power to say no. Hmm. Not to put my signature on another credit card on behalf of my people. And that's why I was so demonized and so despised by the powers that be. They could not believe that I had the, I had the audacity not to take their money. Hmm. <laughs> Okay, guys. So let me let, let me end by asking you. I mean, you 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 took the job, <laughs> so I you must. Take job. It I was mean, a moral imperative. Well, yeah. So 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 let me let me end by asking. It's actually sort of two questions. How do you decide, as a Marxist or a socialist, which trenches to die in? So so for example. Do you buy shares? Do you uh, do you um, shop in Amazon? You know, where where do you de decide on moral or ethical grounds? No, I'm not going to go down that path. So that's the first question. And okay. to wrap up, let me, let me answer it because I'll okay. forget it. Firstly, I don't buy shares. I have a natural and antipathy and ideological opposition to share markets. That's why in my my last book, which was a science fiction novel, and other now where I try to uh, imagine a different world. There are no share markets. Uh, so, no, I don't believe in horse races. I don't believe in the stock exchange. I hate derivatives. I don't do it. Only, you know, I only buy shares indirectly when I can't stop it due to the superannuation fund buying shares on my behalf without asking me, right? <laughs> but I would never buy consciously and uh, purposely, purposefully shares. Do I buy Amazon.com stuff? Of course I do. Because we live in capitalism, I'm not going to to survive if I simply eat and consume products produced under socialist a socialist order, which doesn't exist. <laughs> uh, uh, when do I choose uh, to do something like, for instance, accepting the Ministry of Finance? Well, that election in January 2015 was the election of a political party that had risen from four percent to almost 40% in two years as a result of the popular rebellion against the dead bondage of whole people. The reason I said yes was because for four years I was criticizing what the powers that be were doing. My proposals, similar to what I, I was discussing with you about what to do with the banks, what, what to do with um, um, furlough wages, you know, how to empower the, the, the many, uh, these proposals were accepted and embraced by a young man who's going to be prime minister, very improbable prime minister, because as I said, up until two years before, he had 4% of the vote. Uh, and people were eating out of rubbish bins yeah. as a result of this uh, enslavement, dead bondage. It was like Greece had become like something like a, like a Victorian workhouse. And I was elected, I, I, I didn't think I was going to you know, affect the transition from capitalism to socialism or anything stupid like that. I had one task that I wanted to accomplish, and I was planning to resign the moment that task was accomplished or the moment I realized I could not accomplish it. Yeah. Uh, and the task was to haircut the Greek debt so that we no longer took more credit cards on conditions of further austerity that forced more people to eat out of rubbish bins. 
Mm-hmm. So that's you know, when, when you know my ethos tells me, do it. This is a job that you should try to do, even if the probability of success is low. Mm. So let me let me finish by just asking you simply, what makes you happy and what makes you look forward to the future? What 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 is it that really drives you and and, and gives you hope? Well, besides being with the people that I love and listening to the music that uh, permits me to forget who I am. For me, good art, good music, good cinema must for- help me forget who I am. That is, to, I, I need to lose myself in it. So when I lose myself in good stuff, stuff that other talented people have created, I'm, at, I think, at my happiest. And that's why I'm married to an artist as well. <laughs> um, but more generally, I'll give you the answer that um, um, Captain Picard gives in uh, the next generation of Star Trek, which is, of course, a major source of philosophical s- insights for me, because I'm a Trekkie. I don't know whether you know that. I'm a fanatical <laughs> Trekkie. When uh, he's asked, so the, 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 they they find uh, in space in one of the episodes, in the le- very last episode of season one, they, they find some uh, frozen people from the 20th century, century, industrialists, who froze themselves and had themselves their bodies covered in space in case they are rescued and fixed and, you know, cured in the future. Of course, this happens 24th century. And one of these uh, unfrozen men, businessmen from the 20th century says to Picard, so you have no money here? Um, there are no markets? Uh, everybody gets what you know, their basic needs covered. Um, so what do you do? What's the point of your existence? And Picard says, my friend, to improve yourself. Hmm. I think anything that you're doing to improve yourself in a self-motivated way, you know, you, you play the piano a little bit better. You write a, a better article, uh, a better book, um, you learn how to appreciate a beautiful sunset, you know, more maturely than you did the previous day or the previous year. That's the stuff of life. You make the world just that little bit, mu- that little bit more beautiful. Giannis, yeah. it's uh, been an absolute pleasure. Welcome back anytime. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Shane. That was fun.